So uh, welcome to the my open course, Black Summer. This is a second meeting. And today, uh, last time, last week, we concentrated on suffering me, meaning suffering us each separately, individually. Um, as suffering as something constitutive for something that constitutes individuality, subject as such. And today, uh, this week, we will concentrate on suffering us, not only anxious heart that human have, but also anxious, um, anxious love, the social love, romantic love, uh, any connection that we have. Because uh, the chart that I was showing you last time, this one, uh, the way trying to explain how the uh, perspective of philosophy especially existential philosophy and perspective of psychoanalysis, especially negative psychoanalysis, is different from common sense perspective currently represented by psychology and by our common sense in everyday life, the way we prefer to think, is that there is at the core, at the core of our existence, there is this health, harmony, coherency. Uh, and we need to any anxiety, any depression is the deviation from the health that is within us. We need to discover, to dig deeper uh, and to find this healthy, non-suffering core. This is perspective, this is wrong perspective in my view. And more tragic perspective or perspective that allows more tragedy is philosophic, philosophical perspective, more negative. It claims um, from this perspective, there is anxiety, anxious core of our existence as individuals and the health would be meaning the way to make life bearable to make like to make life livable uh, to somehow try to extend um, escape suffering uh, ameliorate suffering would be the deviation from this core but this core is something anxiety suffering core. it might be consciousness it might be just some other tragedy that humans um, and other creatures go through, but it's constitutive. We can't get rid of it. It's us, it's who we are. We can only try to escape from it. So this is a tragic perspective. Our life kind of sucks, um, but there are ways to, to deal with it. Um, we can't escape it fully. So this perspective, existential perspective, normally, not normally, but if you talk about existential perspective, it is it concentrates on subjectivity, on individuality. It sees this anxiety anxious core as a core of subject and it never uh, discusses anxiety at the core of uh, human love of human connectivity and in my view this chart is also relative it's also relevant uh, to discuss human sociality human connectivity because its anxiety is also at the core at the bottom of human connectivity the bottom of human um, human sociality so it's not only within our heart something that constitutes us that sucks but also at the, at the heart of, of us connecting to each other human connectivity as such which was opposite for not opposite but different for uh, existentialism for heidegger and for kierkegaard we were talking last time about this anxious heart that nothing can heal no matter no matter how good our life life is no matter how um how hard we try how lucky we are in trying to fill the void that constitutes our soul we're still failing there is still something suffering with, within us and uh, this is existentialist perspective uh, but and heidegger would even claim again uh, slide from last lecture, Heidegger would even claim that uh, to have uh, to attain authentic way of existence, we kind of have to learn to suffer, uh, to go through this anxiety, because it separates us from, in his view, from something that separates us from other people, uh, something that uh, contributes to our, our individualization. And for him, uh, other humans, other human beings, uh, our sociality, meet sign, uh, togetherness with others would be uh, the way to escape this uh, internal anxious core that we need to kind of get in touch with to become individuals, to become free, to become better, authentic humans. In my view, 
um, it's even more tragic than that in my view it's not only the core of our individual existence that is uh, anxious but also core of our connectivity with others at the heart of our connections with others uh, is also there is this deep dark uh, bottom deep dark side of them that is that constitutes them that um, that is substantial for them not only we find anxiety angst existential angst within us if you look deep enough but it also we find it um, within our connections with others and there is no way to um, no way to kind of get rid of this dark side because it's from the perspective of my uh, depressive realism and Munch uh, scream that we were discussing last time Briefly, it actually perfectly illustrates um, existentials, existentialist perspective, because uh, Munch, who screams here, the way he explains, um, the way uh, how he explains what happened, uh, right uh, during his walk with a friend, he suddenly started to feel anxious. He suddenly started to feel uh, suffering, and it presupposes we see the dark figures of his friend he actually separates here from his friends he's alone isolated and he feels the anxiety his anxious cord uh, so and everything the world changes there is different perspective for him the nature starts to be the world around him starts to be terrifying so uh it would maybe if we use heidegger terms it would um illustrate the separation from other and you feel your anxiety you uh, get in touch with it or it gets in touch with you it overwhelms you and you become maybe more better human being more individualized we don't I, I don't agree with heidegger in that i think that um it's to, to to claim that it makes us better in some way more or more authentic more free it's still the way of escaping it because it doesn't make sense it's just there we can't get rid of it, but it doesn't make us better. It makes us even more dead. And to somehow veer, to be able to sustain this condition of who we are, of reality of who we are, we need to uh, come up with different kind of um, positive perspective, what it gives us. It makes us better. It what doesn't kill us, might make us stronger, but it actually just kills us. Uh, there is a need to, to presented to ourselves as something that improves us, as something that is positive, not only negative. But uh, Munch is here just to show you that he actually helps to switch um, existentialist perspective from this orientation, concentration on individual, on individual angst, anxiety, to anxiety as something that is seen as collective. So to present uh, co collectivity, connectivity with others as something um, similarly anxious, not a way to escape your anxiety like it was for Heidegger, and not a way of dissolving yourself with others and escaping anxiety, like others for Heidegger's comfort, that where we dissolve, we lose ourselves and we need to like stay away. I think that um, others, there is similarly um, except for the comfort is illusionary the comfort is uh, secondary so there is this angst discomfort unheimlich um, uncanny within the connection with others and in his uh, another painting uh, Munch actually suggests maybe uh, something like this because we see um, from same same series uh, of paintings uh, 1894 his painting anxiety um, represents same uh, bridge, but people are together in it. Uh, and all of them, they look terrified. They look uh, not that much individualized. And we don't see uh, this comfort that Heidegger kind of promises us that we, when we with, with others, we're not anxious, we are anxious. And here, there's this, uh, depersonalization, but not within the comfort of uh, dissolving into others. It just each of them is anxious. Each of them with those empty eyes um, is 
enclosed within themselves is within their own anxiety, but at the same time they're together and sharing this human tragedy of being anxious at their core, of not being able to escape this anxiety. So they are together because they share common human tragedy of being anxious, but at the same time they uh, separated from each other because of this anxiety. And anxiety here is kind of something that at the same time connects uh, and something that at the same time disconnects. And the, the, the dark clothing is um, kind of dissolves into each other. And it, it can all, um, also be presented as a dark mass, the dark clothing that it, we don't see the borders of where one person ends and the other uh, begins. It's like the dark mass of human anxiety. And here is there and here and there, we can see faces kind of separate, popping out of this anxiety um, of separatedness, but it's still, Anxiety is, uh, is in connectivity and within uh, kind of separatedness. Those are not opposites. They weirdly um, coexist. M one of my favorite monks um, paintings, uh, Vampire or the other uh, name for it is Love and Pain, uh, represents monk uh, maybe not Munch's understanding of, of relationship, but of love relationship, romantic precisely, but maybe a uh, relationship as uh, any relationship, any human relationship as such. Uh, if, we, if, we, if we kind of um, encounter this painting and we, have, we are in a romantic mood, we might think that um, in a positive uh, perspective, that trying to look at the bright side of, of life. We might think that this is a, just a romantic picture representing some setting of a uh, woman holding man, kissing him. But uh, the dark colors and the title suggest that it's not, there's um, something else in here. There is not only, it's not romantic. It's um, this, this dark side of, of us. Uh, being romantic, this unheimlich of, uh, of human relationship. So at the same time, uh, she kisses uh, a man, woman, but uh, it's, it's called vampire. So it, at the same time, she, by kissing him, what we can see as a kiss is at the same time is a bite. She's sucking his, his blood. She's sucking his um, energy. And Mm. So this this positive side as keys has a dark side, the sucking, uh, the bite, the fact of the bite, and also her hair. And Moon loves uh, red hair. Um, he's uh, one of his uh, relationship uh, woman. She he was in relationship uh, first one was has has a red head as a red hair. So at the same time, uh, it was sometimes uh, seen as the uh, as a uh, web, right? The spider web, where a spider catches uh, their prey. But at the same time, it can be seen um, as the uh, blood veins, right? Blood veins that connect them together uh, and let them exist, right? They uh, sustain their life. So they are at the same time connected with this hair that at the same time destroys and at the same time allows a uh, couple, allows both of them to, um, to exist. And we see that man here is in a more passive position. Um, his head is on a woman's knees and he's kind of has this blue color which suggests that he's um, morbid colors, right? But this is, and this is the product of the same time of a care of a woman, of, uh, of a woman taking him, holding him. So we don't know either she's killing him or she is, support, she is supporting him. And uh, maybe it is, um, and it was suggested sometimes that it's a representation of, uh, or we can suggest that it's a representation of some kind of toxic relationship. Uh, the relationship where, 
something that demonstrates itself as caring, as care. Uh, at the bottom of it, at the, the true essence of it is the uh, destruction, when the person who cares destroys through the care. But maybe it is, um, you know, representation of uh, love relationship as such. Maybe we are not able to care as such has this dark side to it. Uh, it dissolves, it destroys, but at the same time we need it um, to sustain our lives. So it has this dark side, maybe it's the heart of care, the heart of, of love, but at the same time it's something that destroys. And we can think, um, we can think of this uh, of this painting as a painting of as something that represents mother and a child, uh, the mother's mother's care, mother uh, something that makes child uh, puts child in a passive position. At the same time, it destroys child. It's uh, authoritative, authoritarian to some extent, um, but at the same time, childs need this care right to survive. But there is this dark side uh, to it. When we care, we dissolve identity of other person. We um, uh, we destroy the person at the same time. But so it's it depicts kind of a tragedy of of human love that has this dark side to it. No matter how uh, how hard we try to uh, to cover this side, to get rid of this side, there's all, it always going to be at, at the bottom uh, of human relationships like something opposite to love is at the core of uh, of love mm. and dostoevsky we were talking about dostoevsky last time uh, in connection to Zapfe, meaning that he already knew before Zapfe claimed that there is human consciousness is a mistake that's why it's over overly developed that's why we we tend to suffer um, and we can't get rid of our suffering because it's what constitutes us. As Dostoevsky claimed, uh, said something similar and uh, similarly in his dream of a ridiculous man, which is an amazing um, essay, he shows, uh, this is a quote from him, he claims that on, on earth here, uh, we're only able to love uh, through suffering and we cannot love um, otherwise. But at the same time, he represents the in this dream, in this essay, he presents um, the ideal type of love, non-earthly love as his dream, where people love each other or creatures love each other without, uh, without suffering, without causing um, pain to each other. Uh, without traumatizing each other, without destroying each other. So love, uh, which is maybe universal fantasy, the connectivity of people that is harmonious, that is that doesn't have this uh, dark side, that is positive uh, project, not people uh, support each other without destroying each other. And we have these uh, fantasies within Christianity and Dostoevsky shows his Christian side um, in this essay to, to some extent. Uh, we have this ideal in uh, communism is kind of this ideal where people are able to, um, to, to live without uh, harming each other, without in just uh, society. Uh, psychology is currently um, also articulates the, this ideal of uh, with couple counseling and uh, similar things. Uh, represents this ideal of uh, as possible to to realize right that we it is we can form a society we can form couples where people are exist in harmony when there are no conflicts when there are no uh, when people don't hurt each other so we need this fantasy we all have this fantasy that this is possible that this is actual a hard core of um of our relationship with others. But it, it, this ideal always fails. It never comes true because it's impossible, because it exists only as ideal, only as illusion, something to cover the painful reality of our earthly love that exists through suffering, through us um, 
through us hurting each other. Uh, and psychology would present, uh, for example, couple um, or just pop psychology journals would present um, the conflicts, would present this negative side in relationship as something uh, that we can turn into positive. For example, we can um, improve our relationship or we can uh, learn to um, uh, learn to have relationship without uh, us hurting each other. And we, we do want this to happen, right? We want this, we believe that this is possible, but according to this perspective, the negative perspective or depressive realism perspective, um, that uh, is brought to discuss uh, human relationship, it's impossible because this uh, the dark side uh, of, of love, dark side where we hurt each other is constitutive to it. And the fantasy of uh, harmonious, non-disruptive love is only secondary needed to sustain this dark, um, dark core in a similar way with uh, individual dark core. We need the fantasy that we can be coherent. We need the fantasy that we can um, live happily ever after with ourselves. Uh, in a similar way, we need this fantasy to sustain us, to sustain the mistake of nature that we are. Um, and in a similar way, we need this fantasy to sustain the dark core of relationship with, uh, with others. So we need the fantasy that Dostoevsky represents in the dream of a ridiculous man, the fantasy of love that is not painful, but he admits that on earth, it can only be uh, painful and illusion of its non-painfulness uh, non is a secondary. Freud from last time, you might remember, uh, claims something similar uh, that, there is something in our nature that doesn't restrict us from happiness. And there are uh, three for him instances of this impossibility of, of happiness. First is what we were discussing last week is our, not only our body, but our, ourselves, our consciousness, uh, the problem with, our, uh, with ourselves. And for him, it's now, anxiety and pain is needed because they are warning signals. We can't go on without them. So they're kind of structural uh, for our existence. And external world, uh, nature that doesn't care uh, for external forces of destruction, something that we will discuss uh, next week. And um, finally, what we discuss in today is our relationship to other men and women. And he claims he recognizes that this is the most um, painful one, that it hurts the most. And we can also claim that uh, relationship with others, it is agreed now in social cognitive neuroscience that um, social pain, what is called pain that caused by other, uh, by uh, our relationship with other is the strongest one. Uh, we feel it strongly, uh, more strongly, more pain. It's more painful than a physical pain. And I think we will all agree that we would prefer to lose our leg, some physical injury of our body than losing someone uh, we love. So we would prefer actually physical pain than the social pain because it hurts uh, the later uh, hurts much more. And this uh, something that Freud mentions here that uh, we cannot live without pain and anxiety because they are warning signals for our body. Our body needs it. It's a mechanism that is uh, part of the function of, of the body. We need it for self-preservation. And contemporary social cognitive neuroscience would claim that it's also Similarly, this mechanism of protection of social body, what is called, uh, we need anxiety, social anxiety, we need social pain to protect our social, uh, social body. So the first, maybe one of the first uh, thinkers who started to discuss it was uh, John Bowlby, who was um, criticizing basically Freud 
idea, this idea of a child uh, infant being separated, being egoistic, separated from a uh, mother. And uh, he put more uh, emphasis on our connectivity to others, unlike Freud in at least in Bowlby's interpretation that we are not egoistic from when we're infants, we're not using mother, we don't use other to satisfy our needs, we're not separated from them, but we are uh, internally connected uh, with them. And Bowlby claimed that um, it is something that appears with, uh, with us as individual, we need to um, form strong emotional bonds uh, with other uh, people and basically social cognitive neuroscience would agree with it and the research shows that uh, this mentalization mentalizing uh, uh, the ability to recognize uh, other ability to to form connections with others to direct our attention to others is something that appears really early um, in stage of infant development so if we are attuned to uh, to think about other to to see other to recognize others and i would even put it more uh, and some theories put it in, in in a more radical way that this self consciousness individual consciousness is something secondary it might be even claimed that it appears in the course of evolution as a form of cooperation with others as a part of um, to cooperate with others not as something separate Notice it's sometimes thought that uh, there is egoistic individual consciousness and then it kind of adds up to other people consciousness and we sacrifice something uh, from our egoistic needs and end up uh, to each other to form a relationship. It, it might be seen from opposite side. It's relationship first, it's um, and uh, to others and uh, such a subjective brain, subjective consciousness is the state of this connectivity with others. Uh, social cognitive neuroscience would rather claim that our brain is social uh, because we uh, have this ability to, others are very important to us if we are in a neutral state of, of our um, thinking, if you not direct our thinking consciously to some um, some goal or some topic, we would naturally think about others. Others is something that occupy our brain, therefore brain is social and was developed to sustain relationship with others. That's the position of social cognitive neuroscience. I would claim that uh, it's not, it's even more, it might be even more radical than that. It's not that we have our individual brain and the brain has a need, is social, meaning that it has a need uh, to think about other. We can claim that there is no, it's more like illusion and um, the individual consciousness. It's the instance of interconnectivity with others. Not that there is a brain with a needs, need for the other, but there is no individual brain. It's more like the instance of connectivity with others, something that reflects other, it's something that connects with other uh, in the first place. And then, uh, comes illusion of uh, of separatedness from the other. And the social pain here plays a great role. So basically with this idea, with the concept of a social brain that is now a uh, function as a part of social cognitive neuroscience, they do recognize, um, for example, in this work of Lieberman and Eisenberger, uh, they do recognize uh, that um, social pain, uh, according to their theory, something that uh, is involved in pre preventing uh, physical, in preventing harm of the social body, what can be called, and it's similar to this pain that Freud was talking about, we need uh, ability to feel pain to be able to protect the coherency of our physical body. So we need to know that something hurts, that fire is, uh, fire hurts, therefore we need to stay away from the fire because uh, we need to, we don't want to be physically wounded. In a similar way, they claim that um, social pain is something that um, evolved in, um, in evolution to prevent us uh, being disconnected, disconnected from the other because we are social, we need the other uh, 
to to survive. Uh, one of this theory, uh, the theory that is uh, implied in here is a theory of neoteny that human, it's not actually theory, but neoteny that humans are underdeveloped, they born underdeveloped and they need others for much more, much longer time than other mammals to uh, become mm, more self-sufficient. So we need to form to be able to, to cry, to, to need to demonstrate our need for other to attune uh, to others in order to survive. So the thing here is that the social pain, there is no other way uh, why I'm talking about it, because it's tragic in its nature. Uh, popular psychology would take this idea of social pain, even Lieberman himself would, would do that uh, in his book, uh, Wired to Connect. He would claim that because the social pain is so painful, uh, what follows from that is we need to take care of each other, we need to um, understand that the need for, for, for the other, the, the pain of rejection is uh, great, and we need to take care of the other to prevent kind of the social pain. But they don't see the, the tragic side of their own um, of their own theory because sociality functions through the social pain. There is no other way um, we can't get rid of it, the social pain because it's structural. The other feel for us as a pain, right? Even we, when we are uh, connected, even if we don't feel it, even if we manage to escape it to some extent to ameliorate uh, this pain, when we, uh, the need in, in the other can never be satisfied, right? The other is still separate from us and yet we, we, we need the other, yet we are connected and disconnected at the same time. When, this connection, we feel through this connection, through longing, through missing someone, through um, we, we, we know that other is close to us when they have ability to hurt us, not only ability, but they actually hurt us and it hurts, therefore they're important to us, right? We are only able to, there is no way to just get rid of it and somehow we can ameliorate it. We can learn, um, figure out the ways how to, uh, sustain it somehow, but it's structural to our uh, to our social connectivity. It can't be just um, if you'll throw it away, if you won't be able to feel it anymore, we won't be able to, we won't form a connection because connection, connectivity feels as a pain. Um, and if you turn to psychoanalysis, I promised last time to talk about death drive. So death drive, uh, Freud concept that um, he develops in Beyond the Pleasure Principle in 1920, where he changed his mind, uh, claiming that it's not the pleasure principle that guides humans, but it's a death drive. It's the repetition of, of traumatic, um, traumatic experience. It's a self-destructive. Humans are self-destructive, therefore, kind of, he doesn't claim that they're tragic, but it implies, right, that they're tragic since they, I have this, what he calls repetition compulsion, uh, uh, hopeless creatures who are um, doomed to repeat their traumas. And there is nothing basically, according to late Freud, we can do with it um, substantially, because this is what defines us. And Todd McGovern is great um, in his book, Enjoying What We Don't Have. He's great in a way that he mm, see death drive not only as constitutive to um, individuality, to the subject, but also to social um, connections with others. He interprets death drive in a Lacanian kind of way, claiming that it's, it's this impulse to return to originally traumatic and constitutive loss. So there is not only individual uh, repetition compulsion, a repetition of trauma that defines us, this uh, loss rupture that constitutes us, but it also the repetition of loss, uh, psychoanalytically understood repetition of trauma uh, is also what defines social relationship. To, to explain it, maybe to simplify it at the same time, we can say that psychoanaly psychoanalytically uh, self human subject is the way Zizek puts it, 
already post-traumatic subject because subject starts with um, with trauma and then he goes on repeating this trauma. If we add to this um, existential language, we can claim that there is emptiness at the bottom of our existence. We start with nothing, uh, there's absence of self, and we kind of go through, we're not coherent, we're never a coherent subject, we are always post-traumatic subject. We go on through repeating trauma and through kind of touching, uh, uh, getting in touch with the emptiness, with the loss, uh, that can never be fulfilled. It's like pulsation of the emptiness. So it's not the way psychology represents it, that ideally we need to, we are coherent, we have coherent identity, we have coherent life narrative, and there is supposed to be no ruptures in it ideally. And ruptures are traumas because it's something unexpected, it's something that disrupts the coherency. Uh, psychology would claim that this is not normal, we can avoid it, uh, we can be happy, just uh, this constant growth, uh, coherency, uh, according to this tragic perspective, we as repetition of trauma, as repetition of uh, as death drive, uh, driven by death drive, it's rather than we pulsate, there is the rupture uh, be between the old self and the new self, the trauma, rupture is a trauma. And there is no, there is no coherency in us. Coherency, Mm, is something that is only illusion, it's only fantasy, something that we need to uh, cover this loss, the emptiness, the rupture, the trauma. Uh, it's always secondary, it's always comes to cover, but it never cover fully who we are. So we, we uh, remain tragic, we remain post-traumatic subject, but somehow uh, some of us um, manage to hide it from themselves more or less successfully some don't um, and in similar way so this is this would be psychoanalytic existential and existential representation of who we are as a tragic creatures death driven but McGovern's idea is to show death drive as um, something that constitutes sociality too and we can say that there's not only ruptures in a, between our old self and new self, this pulsation of trauma, repetition of trauma, repetition of rupture, but also between subject and subject, between subject and, um, and society, subject and others. And we, so this rupture here is constitutive also for relationship with others, there is with others. And it feels as a traumatic, the core, uh, is traumatic and it's anxious. That's why for Lacan, anxiety is the only effect uh, that doesn't lie. So uh, when we, and this is what maybe happens during conflicts, when people fight with each other, they can feel that um, the absence of coherency, the, this traumatic core that uh, is there, this, then, Coherency appears within conflicts and when people fight as the as illusion, as um, as uh, not true. But then we again we normally uh, after the fight ends, we we are able to sustain. This means normally that we are able to sustain illusion of coherency and of uh, the absence of rapture, the absence of uh, loss. <clears throat> so this could mean that there is emptiness between us, the loss that at the same time separates us and at the same time connects us. We connect it through the rupture, through this loss, through, through emptiness. Um, and there is no way to uh, become, to, to form, uh, to get rid of this uh, traumatic core of human relationship and fully substituted to uh, to fully cover the loss, to feel the loss that is constitutive, to feel this emptiness, to fully um, fuse, to go into fusion completely with each other, right? Into this harmonious whole uh, that we think we're able to end up in, or that there is at the heart of our relationship with each other. We just need to kind of actualize it. It's not there. At the bottom is the rupture, is the, we can say it's death because um, not life, but death and 
you were talking about this with Todd McGovern, and he agreed that death drive is uh, there is something uh, from there's something death driven in love, basically everything maybe. Uh, so at the, from the position of depressive realism, uh, since you are this depressive, uh, the heart of human being is depressive. Uh, depression is our nature, Anx anxiety is our nature. It means that to fully coincide, and the suicidal thoughts is actually the most realistic thoughts. When we suicidal, uh, when we anxious, we see the reality of ourselves, of who we are, reality of the world. And to fully coincide with this, our nature, which is a mistake, um, is to, to, to actually commit suicide, is actually stop existing. It, it, it's death. So somehow life is extended, uh, extended suicide, extended death. We figure out a way how to escape um, this core, but at the end, we won't escape it uh, anyway. We'll just, at the end, when we physically dead, we'll just start coinciding with, uh, with our, with the emptiness that we are, uh, were before you we were born. In a similar way, uh, to fully coincide with the nature of our relationship is also to, um, to destroy, uh, to, to die. Uh, those who participating in relationship, those who are in the relationship themselves, right, is destructive. Um, that's why when people, uh, when people fighting, they might physically uh, destroy each other. And, um, and love hurts and sometimes uh, it hurts uh, when we feel in fully in touch with the nature of love. It's too, too, too much to sustain. It is uh, destructive. So to maybe uh, to love and to live at the same time is to be able to lie, to be able to, uh, to, be able to uh, have those illusions that doesn't let you fully coincide with who you are and with what relationship with others are. And that's what, what we all do because we are still uh, alive. And um, according to McGovern, ideology, he, uh, ideology is for him everything, basically Christian ideology, any perspective that offers uh, a hope of positive, uh, seeing human relationship as positive project, as uh, promising harmony, promising non-suffering, promising absence of conflict, everything everything can be fine in our relationship with others. That's Christianity with the idea of heaven and us uh, loving each other, or just not sure what do they do in heaven, but uh, don't destroy each other, definitely. It's a communist perspective, left perspective, where we also uh, forming, are uh, able to form society that is completely, or to some extent, uh, doesn't imply suffering. So uh, capitalist ideology to some extent, and um, psychology also as um, psychology as ideology now the most powerful one promises that it's possible to follow in some psychological some recommendation of uh, experts psychologists we will be able to form healthy relationship there is the relationship where we won't suffer and it's like the standard for us um, it offers hope that this non-suffering relationship with other ideology is kind of um, works to cover the rupture uh, between uh, between us, but it's not true, right? It's uh, and um, to some extent, I think that recognizing emptiness and connecting through the emptiness would be genuinely connecting to others, not through ideology, not through, uh, but genuinely and. Following this logic, it's supposed to hurt. It's supposed to uh, not be that, uh, not, not supposed to be that pleasant, right? Because emptiness, the score is anxious if you follow the perspective of depressive realism. And uh, Dwayne Russell claims in his book, Real Love, something similar. He actually agrees here with Braha Ettinger, claiming that there is this anxiety primordial anxiety of compassion 
that is the most painful one. And maybe being with others is, uh, is not, first of all, happiness and joy, but um, some endurance through suffering. And um, maybe when we feel joy of being with others, it's, it comes uh, in a contrast with, uh, with us longing for the other. It's kind of time of, it can be seen as just mm, as a peaceful moment that we feel as enjoyment, as a happiness in contrast to how painful the other is. So it's not that, therefore, it's impossible to feel this bliss all the time because it comes only as a relief from the more substantial continuity of suffering that other uh, other is. But it, sometimes it might not come at all, uh, this joy and uh, happiness. It might be uh, the nightmare, right? Uh, that never ends. But sometimes when it ends, when we feel when we sustain the illusion of, of happiness and of, it's only uh, the moment of escape, the moment where we able not to feel, uh, maybe to feel less pain or relax from the pain. So just saying that it might be something secondary, not something that defines relationship, but what defines relationship could be suffering and illusion of happiness or happiness as uh, secondary and less substantial to it. And there are some options how a relationship with others could be through this, uh, through loss of some in Lacan, uh, Lacan's interpretation is sharing what we don't have, sharing the emptiness, emptiness. not escaping the emptiness, but um, sharing this luck, touching on the level of, of loss, uh, still sharing emptiness, connecting through the rupture the tragic uh, relationship, which in my view are more genuine relationship. And some of the options uh, could be uh, forgiveness, according to Kristeva. Mm, forgiveness is something like that. It's something that uh, allows a subject to be connected. It doesn't cover, unlike ideology, the rupture between the other. It doesn't provide the escape from the evil uh, that other is the emptiness that other is and the emptiness that connects us it actually uh, helps might be seen as a mechanism of connecting us through the loss through the emptiness Christeva writes I think it's the last slide Christeva writes that for forgiveness is uh, outside of history uh, and it stays uh, kind of forms the different uh, time frame. It doesn't follow the, it, it represents rather rupture. It doesn't follow the coherency of the events. Um, it's not, so it's, uh, it's sharing a lack uh, with the other in a form that it doesn't substitute this lack, doesn't aim to substitute the lack with the, uh, with some kind of illusion of coherency. It's actually a space uh, beyond events, beyond the coherency that other is, that helps uh, space of emptiness and coincidence with the emptiness that other is. Because when we, uh, when we forgive other, or we, when we're not able to forgive other, we would claim uh, someone. We would claim, and how could you do that? How is it possible? We, we don't, we, uh, and now it's not fashionable to forgive. It's more uh, recent tendencies it's to cancel, to get rid. So we think, and it, this is a positive project again, canceling, uh, even though it's negative, it cancels people or cancels some features in people, they're bad. Um, but still it's a positive project because it aims to, to form a perfect society without bad people, uh, without bad features in the people. It's not able to accept other in their evilness in their rupture with themselves in their painful um, painful nature. And forgiveness can. That's why it's deadly, of course, if you completely forgive everything, you die. <laughs> um, but at the same time, but the can cancellation to cancel people is also you destroy them, right? Um, you cancel them from, 
from society or you cancel some features of people uh, it, but it destroys um, fully and it destroys um, rapidly not gently um, and forgiveness destroys gently enough it's um, you destroy yourself uh, you coincide with this destruction that you are, with the emptiness that you are, and you kind of accept the other in uh, their evilness, their um, the coincidence in the, the traumatic core, right? You're able to sustain the trauma that other is. Again, if you fully do it completely, you're dead. Uh, same if you actually genuinely in love and coincide with the nature of love. It's also uh, extremely deadly because you coincide with the nature of, of love. But uh, at the same time, to make it more genuine, it's to, um, it's to be able to forgive, to be able to sustain, to connect through the emptiness, through the rapture, to recognize other in their traumatic core of them, uh, in something anxious, um, and to sustain maybe your own anxiety that you uh, react with on the traumaticity of, of relationship. And also any, um, not only forgiveness, forgiveness is just one of the options, but also any moral ethical act is the act of coincidence with the um, moral, meaning something that sustains sociality, right? Uh, it also presupposes a coincident with the rapture. It's self-sacrifice. You discover you coincide with empty, place that you are, uh, for example, um, moral act of giving or giving a present to someone. Mm, if you, it presupposes, the act of giving presupposes self-sacrifice because uh, there's supposed to be no interest, no gain within the act of giving. If there is a gain, if it's a positive project, it's not sharing of emptiness that you are, it's not a gift. Uh, it's uh, it's the imitation of the gift. If you want, if you give something to someone and you want something in exchange, it's not moral act and it's not a gift. But um, for something to be moral, there's supposed to be this part of self destruction and of coincidence with an empty place. You give something without uh, as a negative act, without expecting anything in return, um, as a waste kind of, and uh, which supposes. Uh, self, we can say self-destruction. So the sharing of nothing that you are, but are others supposed to do the same for the sharing of emptiness, of loss to, um, to exist. So it's kind of as well, um, especially Christian ethics, it's the basis, this negative core trauma, uh, suicidal core of who we are is the basis of uh, human sociality from this perspective too. I was talking too long, I'm sorry. If you have any questions <laughs> or answers, I would be glad to um, to hear them. Yeah, Julie? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was, uh, this is reference to the painting by Edward, um, Vampire, Love and Paint. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I was linking this with, um, uh, you know, the early infant, uh, mother relationship from Kleinan perspective. And then where uh, the infant uh, is uh, at times uh, aggressive, hostile, and assaults the mother essentially. And, uh, and the mother forgives the infant and the child. And, uh, and likewise, the infant is also forgiving, forgives the mother for, um, for her shortcomings or uh, you know, her actual limitations. Um, so I thought like, the, I don't know if Klein uses the word forgive or the term forgive, but I thought that was interesting, particularly in psychoanalytic uh, framework where um, uh, I think uh, this term is not, I haven't seen that much use of this term or, um, or even sacrifice such. Thank you, Ari. Yeah, it is uh, right in relationship between infant and mother, you, you kind of um, when they are trying out your boundaries, what you whether you're able to or even hurt you on purpose just to 
um, to feel it and to maybe learn to forgive and then you forgiving and they learn to to forgive in exchange so this whole mess of um, of traumatic core of human relationship is uh, represented in a mother child uh, relationship just it's less obvious it's more obvious within those relationships but less obvious within the relationship with our romantic ones because we are now uh, can break up and we're not uh, thinking that there might be and there might maybe be a less traumatic relationship or at least i would say relationship where this traumatic core is more effectively covered but with mother child relationship it's harder much harder to cover because uh, it's kind of our responsibility to <laughs> to be in this relationship for quite a long uh, time so it becomes uh, obvious and of course we would blame it to underdeveloped psyche of a child that it's a mess um, but maybe it's not maybe it's just a child who doesn't know yet how to cover this this basic uh, principle of uh, of relationship thank you Arvin. yes Yes. Yes. Can you hear me, Julie? Yeah. Hello. Um, it, it was really um, interesting to listening to you. Um, my question is because I'm I'm interested about this idea of connectivity and sociality. So actually, I have two related questions. Um, the one is about when you you speak about uh, social um, pain uh, or yeah, social pain. But do, is this actually uh, emotional pain? Is there a difference between social pain and emotional pain? And uh, the other question that comes to my mind, that's kind of like, it's more kind of procedural, like kind of like a bit of clarification. But the other question that comes from this line of thought, starting with the Lacanian idea of this, the lack of the subject, that this emptiness that you were kind of going emphasizing, um, and then that we actually, uh, we experience this pain and this is uh, the, the idea of social, sociality and connectivity through pain. But isn't this then the only way to, uh, for us as an empty subjects to um, evolve into um, kind of like, I don't know, I won't say feel this emptiness, but actually to, to evolve into subjects through, through sociality? Mm -hmm. uh, because, um, I mean, just the example, not the example, but the current, the current language of individualism, the liberal state that we live in, is very much about like self-isolated individuals, self-sufficient individuals. So that's a trauma for the social, but that's from following for whatever, like your talk and your psychoanalytical uh, ideas, but these traumas, okay, they're internal to us. They're, as if I don't want to say the word essential, any essence to talk about essence here, but it's something that marks us, like our human condition from whatever I get from the talk. Mm -hmm. But then is it that exactly through the sociality and through the pain that we experience through this trauma that we actually going, evolving through life, the only way to live life is through this as a subject. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I made myself clear. I hope I did. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe at least more clear than me. <laughs> Thank you. So I think it's a good idea actually to say that all social pain is just emotional pain. There's, there, there's this new, mm, not that new, but still new concept, social pain. But if we social creatures, our emotions are social. It's not that, you know, it's always about someone. It's always someone that hurts, mm -hmm. even if it's, uh, has nothing to do with other for example mm -hmm. i feel that we are failure or something but failure you know for for other in a world of of people it can any emotion i think it can be said that social pain is just emotional pain because human mm -hmm. are social therefore their emotions are um social too so it is uh, it can be said that it's just emotional pain the one that is more painful than physical one the one that we would rather avoid and prefer a physical one. And this uh, idea that we evolved into subject, um, yeah, I would agree um, in terms that there is maybe a need to learn how to uh, sustain the suffering that other is. Um, 
uh, I'm not sure it improves us. It has improves as you can say, but um, at least I hate the idea that it just makes us happier, that the relationship with other can be completely happy and the other we can learn how to make each other happy. I think it's, um, it's always, not I think, but it kind of proven, just refused to recognize it, that even scientifically proven that the, the other hurt and that it means, it implies that this fantasy of us not hurting each other at the end is just the illusion. It will never come true. And we would rather, we have to learn how to sustain the suffering that other is. We might say that it makes us better people we might say it um, more, I don't know, uh, evolved. But at the same time, from the perspective of depressive realism, any improvement is the just, you know, secondary illusion, something that just helps uh, helps to, uh, to live a life and to be with others. It just, uh, again, what is improvement? <laughs> but, um, <laughs> And the self is isolation that we now currently um, witness in a capitalist society. I think it's questionable thing. I think the fact that we are more detached from the other, it might be a reaction on something opposite that we are more, we precisely learning, we are more connected and there is, uh, we are more sensitive to the pain that are there is and therefore we're just escaping because it's too much. Uh, the other so it might be everything might be okay in this in this um, so it's not that you know we are terrible people uh, and we need to learn to become better people maybe we are <laughs> amazing already maybe we tend to isolate escape because it hurts but we and again we were talking last time and Arvin has some thoughts about it this isolation uh, solitude it might be just they might coexist and they might be um it might be the way of dealing with the other, the isolation, you know, you, they are in you anyway. You isolate it, you connect it through isolation or you feel the other, therefore you you feel the presence of the other, you feel maybe more safe uh, because you know that there is the other to rely to and therefore you are able to sustain your solitude. So it's not the completely two opposites. Isolation might be way of, current way of dealing and even learning to be uh, with the other or not to bother other that much. So it maybe everything is fine. Maybe we just hurt uh, each other and we're learning <laughs> through isolation how to sustain this, um, this pain. Maybe this process of learning is happening even with the capitalist society. And the very critique that we, lots of us now have that we are more isolated. Maybe this is the pro, this process, you know, that we <laughs> actually aiming to not be isolated, but at the same time we are isolated, but we hate it about ourselves. Yes, thank you. I just want not to clarify, but uh, because, you know, you so um, kind of picked up on my words in, some, in terms of like evolving in, uh, on the psyche uh, in positive terms to get better or happy. That's very much the mm, psychological course that goes now when you go and you're broke and you need to develop yourself or um, feel better, be a better person. All these positiveness that you need to accomplish, that you need to achieve and you're striving towards to get a better person. But somehow I'm, I completely agree with your last words that you were just saying about how this separateness and this isolation actually, um, it's not to evolve into anything better or in that kind of uh, mm, sequences of uh, mm, semantics or semiotics even, but more about actually making life livable, bearable, just mm -hmm. to be, yeah, to be able to live it. But at the same time, sometimes, uh, you know, some moral act and being with the other presuppose that your life is not bearable, like you're taking care of, um, of uh, uh, elderly parents that are dying, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't make your life better. It might even, you know, not make your completely a better person because you sacrifice other parts of life. Uh, taking more care of someone who will die and less care it's normally a problem the kids at that uh, in this situation so it's it not even make you better 
and your life, but you still have to do it, right? So, and that's the tragedy. It doesn't, the person will die anyway. You mm -hmm. waste your time on them. You don't uh, take uh, sufficient care of someone who will, who you responsible your kids. That's the situation. So you're terrible and you, um, you're great in the same time and your life is not livable at that moment. And it's quite absurd situation. So it's, it's questionable. <laughs> Thank you very much, Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have questions or, or you want to <clears throat> isolate yourself for the rest of the day? Yeah, shall we? Uh, Julie? Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking, uh, reference to uh, Juliana, uh, is that correct? Am I pronouncing? Yeah, Juliana, I was thinking of uh, Sabina Spliren's, uh, uh, you know, uh, work that uh, compassion requires suffering, like you have to suffer if you're, if you're compassionate, or like, so uh, in relation to the other, um, and that affect is at the central, like of all this, like uh, affect needs to be there and one needs to endure all that um, and just as you said there's no like there's not outcome like there's not a, a result that you're getting like expecting or anything so. just there yeah i forgot to mention sabina Spira, and it's very important to mention her because she was the one who came up with the idea of a death drive as driving humans before freud uh, he, freud is just more well known and it was her who said that it's really something that is a part of our relationship with others. Unlike Freud, who started to concentrate on death drive as individual uh, kind of characteristic. And she was talking about the uh, a pain, the destruction that is a part of a creation, that is a part of a sexual relationship, romantic relationship that uh, result in new life. There is also destruction to this on biological and psychological uh, level and the relationship feels like anxiety there is always this dark side to it not only perfect side thank you Arvin shall we finish with this tribute <laughs> to, to Sabina Spielrein yeah thank you all for participating I hope to see you uh, next week when we are going to talk about the evolution and nature that doesn't care about us at all <laughs> see you next week bye thank you thanks thank you. bye thank you. Thank you. bye